Good morning, everyone. Hello. Good morning, everyone. That's a little better. Let's stand together a minute. Welcome to the Argyle Church of Christ. Take a second to say hello to somebody real quick. Greet somebody around you. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the king. As an innocent fair we lifted up today while his ransom one we see. Marching on, marching on, for Christ and everything above, for the king. Good morning, Argyle. To those who are here in person, welcome. And remember, we've got communion cups in the lobby for you. For those of you who are online, welcome. We're delighted that you're with us. Please type something so that we know that you're there and we can greet you. Um, I'm wearing my vintage Go and Love shirt. So if you have not picked up your Go and Love tools, including a Bible journal, Everything's in the lobby, so please go and grab those. And today is the deadline for donations to Trinity Rescue Mission. So please see Derek or Michelle if you have donations for them. If you forgot, I'm sure they would be delighted to have a conversation with you about something that you can do to assist in the future. Also, I brought a, a visual aid and it's coming apart a little bit. So this is a Nicaragua box. Jason has a coworker from Nicaragua and he gave her the list. So there's brochures and it has a list of things to put in the Christmas box. And he said, hey, does this make sense? And she looked at the list and she said, yes. And she said, you know what they really need is shoes. So you can't fit a pair of shoes and everything else in the box, but you can fit a pair of flip flops if you're really careful and you're very good about smushing things together. So please grab some flip-flops, fill a box, and bring it back there due, I believe it's September 5th. Is there's next Sunday. next Sunday, September 5th. Uh, we need items for the pantry as well, so canned fruit, green beans, and corn. So bring those in as you come. And I just wanted to read the names from our most recent prayer list so that they would be top of mind for everyone. Linda Seward, Star and David Kirby, Doug Guthrie, who's here this morning, it's great to see you, Doug. Helen Clark, Kathy Anna, 
Janet Gardner, Carlos and Tanya Astez, Eric Lamons, George Bagshaw, and Jeanette Wolf. Please keep everyone in your prayers. And speaking of prayers, please send us your prayer request to Ar argyle.com. Argylechurch.com. Thank you, Brad. Argylechurch.org. All right, so that's the third time, the third time I got it right. So argylechurch.org. I'll put that on my notes next time. Or you can fill out a prayer card and drop it off in the plate in the lobby. You can also drop your contributions there if you're in person. All right, thank you all. Let's worship God. After the example that Dennis and Brad set, I thought I would give a try this week at the memory verse. And let me tell you, this memory verse is, is not easy. And so I'm just flat out being honest with you. I have brought my cheat sheet up here in case I mess up, which is probably the case. It's going to happen, okay? So this is Psalms 96, verses 2 through 4. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare, declare, his, declare his glory among the people, his, his magnificent works among the... <clears throat> I've already messed it up. Declare his glory among the nations, his magnificent works among the people. For great is the Lord, and to be greatly praised. And... <clears throat> And he shall be feared above all other gods. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of glory. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of love. Michael told on himself by having a cheat sheet because I threatened him <laughs> and said I was going to tell you all, so he beat me to it. So, <clears throat> Before the communion service, we're going to sing a song. It's called We Saw Thee Not. We had a preacher, Ken, and he and I used to argue about this song because he didn't like this song just because of the name. We Saw Thee Not. Some kind of archaic language. Well, let me just tell you. The song was written in the mid-1800s by a lady who was brought up, and her husband and her dad were bigwigs in the old church. And she wrote this song because of like a Doubting Thomas song. And even though we're not there to see some of the things, we have faith that they happened. And that's what this song is about, so... Take that, Ken, if you ever listen to us. You should start liking this song. <clears throat> we saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet we held thy body's home in that despite. So 
good Josh because I got told to stay up here today it wasn't by choice trust me I'm not used to holding something in my hand to talk I could, I'm pretty loud without all this but man those lights will put your eyes out but we're here for a very serious thing that is that we commune together at the Lord's Supper and I was thinking about this because yeah, Keith called me yesterday and said, I want you to do it because I got to work today. And I said, sure, no problem. And uh, got to thinking, I've been fortunate in my life. I have traveled to 26 different countries throughout the world. I've seen a lot of things. And I've gone through a lot of airports. One thing that always sticks out, particularly over the last 10 to 15 years, is luggage. Now, I'll admit, Carly will tell you, sometimes I've been known to overpack when I go on a trip. A little bit. Because after all, for a seven day trip, you need seven pair of shoes. Right, ladies? <laughs> right? Or at least, I, anyway. But, that being said, you see people walking through the airport. I love Miami. I love Newark. Because those are two places, they will put saran wrap on your luggage. They will wrap it all up. I want you to send it to TSA, who's going to unwrap it, and then kind of put it back together. Said that for a reason. How many of us, and I always want to say something that applies to me, we're pretty good about carrying our own burdens, aren't we? We don't need any help. We got this, or so we think. We lug it, we put it in backpacks, we put it in our luggage, and you, we're going through the airport and we're just bringing it through us and we just can't hardly walk because we've got so much stuff. But we got it. I know for me, I don't speak of anybody else. Any of us have any burdens up here that we're toting around? Maybe it's guilt. It was for me for a long time. 
about some very poor choices I made that broke up a family. And that baggage stays with you for a long time. It's hard to get rid of. Maybe it's something you've, maybe it's fear in there too. We're talking about, well, I probably can't see it as big as I am, but you know, going, going, what keeps us back sometimes? The weight, I know. But thank you for that support. <laughs> but the weight of all this stuff up here, of our past, of our problems, of our mistakes that keeps us, I don't know. And if I can go, I really can't go at full speed because after all, I gotta pack all this stuff with me. I'm the only one qualified to carry it. Not really. We need to let it go. If you remember the lesson last week about Brad, who's in control? Not us, but man, we think we are sometimes. We got this and we're so pitiful. So pitiful. He died to get that burden off of us. He even says it in a few places. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Psalm 55, I believe it's verse 22. He will not allow the righteous to suffer harm. Depending on your translation. Most of you can quote Matthew 11, what is it? 28 through 30. My yoke is easy. And what about my burden? It's light. You read in, what is it, Hebrews 12, the first two verses, you have all that history of people who are very faithful. And he says, no, look back at those examples. Let us put aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets us and run the patience right before us. It's hard to go, though, when we're burdened up. I was a, look at me now, you won't believe it. I was the fastest wide receiver, which I know that's a really stretch, isn't it, on my high school football team. I could run the 40 and 4-1. And you're saying, no, I used to could. Now, maybe 41, and I'm like, I could get there. Okay? But you see where I'm going with this. I don't know what your burden is, but if I were to venture a guess, I'd probably say that maybe some of us in here are carrying a little bit of it that we don't need to. When God stretched out his arms, and his feet nailed to a cross to alleviate that from us. But again, we got to carry it. No, we don't. Keep that in mind. As we go to the Lord's Supper, we're, we're mindful of those emblems that he gave up for us to be free of burdens. Father, we thank you for loving us, giving us compassion when we didn't deserve it. We're not as often prepared as we think we are to go through life. Father, help us to see our weaknesses. Help us to know that you love us. Help us to see how much you care. As we take these emblems, we're reminded of that great sacrifice you made for us to ease our burden. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you be poured out like wine upon the altar? For me, would you be broken by bread to feed the hungry? Would you be so on with me that you would do this as I will? Would you be like and like? And love my word fulfilled. Yes, I'll be poured out my wine upon the altar for you. Yes, I'll be broken my bread to feed the hungry. Yes, I'll be so one with you that I would do just as you will. Yes, I'll be like and life and love your word Craig, thank you. Thank you for that. Where are you from? Uh, Archibald, Louisiana. 
Masters, the tempest is raging. Near there or right there. <clears throat> Father, take care of the people. <clears throat> we have a song before the, before the lesson this morning, and it was somebody requested this. Somebody said, why haven't we sung this in a long time? And I said, well, it's Trent's fault. He, he had his iron on. No, I'm kidding. Uh, and it reminded me to tell you, if you've got something we haven't sung in a long time and you want to do it, let somebody know, let me know, let Trent know. <clears throat> Let's stand together and sing this song. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm leaning every day. So praying as I am around. Lord, pray my feet on higher ground. Lord, let me up and be sad. And when the heavens they will land, I will pray that I am proud. A good morning today. I know that there's a lot that um, is on our minds and thoughts that bring us concern. Uh, we, our thoughts are with those in Afghanistan. Our thoughts are with those on the coast and uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And there's thousands of other things that, that concern us that are on our minds, but this time right now we are giving those to God and we're choosing to worship this morning. So, it is still good to be here today with you. Um, sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the people. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. We serve an amazing Creator God this morning. And so... 
this morning, uh, just a reminder in our study, we're in Acts chapter 11 from this Sunday to next Sunday, so please be pouring into these Acts journals. One chapter this week. And if you got questions, write them down, seek them out, uh, write quotes, write notes, um, look for how God is informing you through his word how to go and love, how to be his witnesses in the world that we live in. So Acts chapter 11 this week in our, in our personal study, um, I want to show you, I know I've shown hummingbirds before, but I just think hummingbirds are truly amazing. Um, I'm about to show you a video of baby hummingbirds. And to me, anytime you see a hummingbird, it's almost like this special moment. It's this rarity. Now, maybe you have a hummingbird set, uh, feeder in your backyard and you see them all the time. Uh, but for most people, you don't see a hummingbird very often. And uh, I would venture to say it's extremely rare to actually find a hummingbird nest. Look how small and tiny they are. These little tiny birds that the hummingbird is feeding. It's truly incredible. The hummingbird is this incredible bird. It can fly in any direction, it, unlike any other bird. Okay, it can fly, it hovers. That's why it's a hummingbird. It has a fast metabolism, a hundred times faster than that of an elephant, the hummingbird's metabolism. Uh, it, it, it is a migrating bird. It migrates hundreds, even up to thousands of miles. It can travel 23 miles a day, this hummingbird. Now, even though it is this incredible, uh, with a fast metabolism bird, it can flap his wings up to 200 times. Listen to this, 200 times a second. Isn't that unbelievable? Incredible. They can flap their wings up to 200 times a second. No wonder why their metabolism is so high. But when they sleep, when they sleep, they go into what's called torpor, which is basically a hibernation state where they're barely even breathing. Oh, I heard. Did y'all hear that? Okay. All right. Just making sure it wasn't me up here. As a car or something, I don't know. It got me off, off track. But these hummingbirds are truly amazing creatures. So here's the humming, baby hummingbirds. The other one that I want to show you today is the mimosa pudica, which is a plant. And uh, we've, some of us have experienced this when we went to Honduras, these plants that move. So let's go ahead and show that. You touch these plants and they move. I don't know if you've ever seen a plant like this. Okay, he's touching the, the, uh, the actual flower and they, they, they shrink when touched and you touch them again and it falls down. Just this truly incredible like technology. This technology within the plants themselves is truly incredible. And I'm sure that's probably just a random chance of nature. <coughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Can you see it this morning? Do you see the eternal power and divine nature of our creator God and the things that he's, that he's made? We worship an incredible God. Let's perceive it today. So I have a vague memory of when I was at school, one of the first group assignments that I got. One of the first group assignments. I don't know if this was first, uh, second grade. I was very young, but it was one of the first group assignments. And so I had, in my mind, I'm going to pick some partners that are some of the smartest kids in class. And so I did that. I paired up with some smart kids in class. And in the discovery of the group dynamics, what I realized is that I actually really didn't even need to do anything. That my partners, they had a plan and they were smart and they were gifted. And I could actually just coast along. You see, I had an assignment, but no work. I had an assignment to do, but I didn't have work to do. And I could even get an A with that. Now in comparison to that, I also remember a summer where the summer days were coming to an end and the new, the, the new school year was upon us and it dawned on me that I had summer homework. I had summer homework, so I had work to do but little time. And this time I didn't have friends, I didn't have a group that was going to do the work for me. I had to do the work. But I was motivated because I did not want to enter school and start off behind, so I became very focused. I don't know if you've ever been there before, where you realize maybe you have an assignment, you've got to get to work, and you just get really focused on that task. So that was me that summer. I had work to do. I became very focused. I had a purpose. Purpose is fuel. Having purpose can fuel your effort. 
So I wanted the grade, so I went to work. I was on a mission. So there was another time that came to mind where I had purpose fuel. And that was uh, in South Florida when at Michelle and I's first home, we decided we were gonna put in a brick paver patio. And so I did all the prep work and I, and I took out all the tree roots and I got, I got the right sand and compacted it. Every, and I was down to the final couple steps. And I was taking each brick one by one with a rubber mallet and setting it into place. I had work to do. And as I'm working, I started to get a little muscle fatigue. You know, that's a very repetitive thing you're doing with, you know, thousands of bricks. And so, I, but that's okay. I got work to do. I was on a mission. Okay, well, I started to get a little hungry. Well, that's all right. That's okay. You know why? I got work to do. I had purpose fuel. It began to rain on me. That stinks. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. You know why? I got work to do. I had some purpose fuel. I had a mission. Okay? Well, my muscles started getting out so much that I could no longer hold on to the mallet. So I got to go with two hands now. And I'm working. I had purpose fuel. I remember Michelle came out to me and offered me some water. And it was like I was just so on a mission. That water was almost like this. It took me back to what life was about. But I was so focused on the job at hand. I had this purpose fuel. And purpose gives us, gives us this, the ability in our effort. Uh, the title of the, the talk this morning is Purpose Fuels Passion. Purpose Fuels Passion. If you have no purpose, you begin to ask yourself, why am I here? What is the reason? It can lead to depression. It can lead to all sorts of negative things. But when we have purpose, when we have purpose, it changes everything. Let's get to work. And so I have a very big question for us this morning. And the question that I want us to think about this morning is this. Do you believe you are on this earth for a purpose? And I don't mean what your lunch plans are today. That may be your purpose as you, you schedule this and do this. I, I don't mean for today. I don't mean about your, your calendar plans for tomorrow. I don't mean your work responsibilities. This is, this is what you're purposing to do today. We can fill our time with so many things. But, but, be, but grander than all of that, when you look at your life, can you answer this question? Do you believe that you were put here for a purpose? We need to find and discover that question. I think that the answer is in the text that we'll read today. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 13 today. In Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 1, it says, Now there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Niger Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and sent them off. So here we are at the church of Antioch. And it says that at Antioch, there are prophets and teachers. And of these prophets and teachers, the Holy Spirit said, Barnabas and Saul, I have a work set out for you. I have a purpose for you. I have a, a set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So basically the Holy Spirit says, I have purpose for you. When we go to verse 4 through 12, we see that they set sail to Cyprus. They leave Antioch. They go through Seleucia. They get to Cyprus, this island. And when they, when they um, arrive at the island, they go from coast to coast. And while they're on this island, they proclaim the word in the synagogues. And they also met Sergius Paulos and Bar-Jesus. Now, who are Sergio Paulus and Bar-Jesus? Sergius Paulos was a... A proconsul, he was an intelligent man, but he was a proconsul for Rome. So he was a, a basically the governor or military commander for Rome at this location. 
Who's Bar Jesus? Bar Jesus was with him, or also known as Elymas, who was a Jewish false prophet and a magician. And when Sergius Paulos found out that they were on this island, that they were proclaiming this word, he wanted to know what it was. So he summoned them to come to him. But Bar Jesus opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And it says that Saul looked at Bar Jesus intently, and he said this in verse 10 and 11 You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and, and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. So, needless to say, Sergius Paulos believed. When he saw this, when he saw the power that was on display, he believed. Then they leave Cyprus. So they leave in verses 13 through 15. They leave Paphos through Perga and they come to Antioch. But not the Antioch where they started. This is a different Antioch. They come to Antioch in, Pis in Pisid Pisidia. Pisidia. How do you pronounce that? Help me out this morning. I don't want to lose my job this morning. And while they're there, they went from synagogue to synagogue. And they're spreading the word of God in the synagogue. And on one occasion, they were asked, Brothers, if you have a word of encouragement, will you go ahead and say that? Well, let me ask you, do you think they're going to take the opportunity to give a word of encouragement to those this morning? That's the question. Do you? Yes, of course, they're up for the opportunity. Yes, I've got a word for you. So in verse 16, so Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness and after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all of my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior Jesus as promised. So, do you have a word of encouragement? Yes, I do. And so he begins by sharing this quick history of a nation. A story, a history of a called out nation. He says that God chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in Egypt. But remember that God chose their fathers before their fathers was the father Abraham, the father of a nation who was called out from other nations. So he chose our fathers. He led us out of Egypt through the, direct, for, through, uh, the leadership of Moses. He put up with the people in the wilderness. Then he gave, he drove out the nations before them to give them their land. He rose up judges and then King Saul and then David, a man after my heart. To clarify that one who will do all of my will. And it's this man. This is the last verse that we just read of this man. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Of this man's off, offer, um, offspring, David, a man who was after the will of God, was after the heart of God. This man who would do all the will of God came Jesus, who is the savior as promised. So we have to go back to the promise. Remember that promise to the father of a nation, Father Abraham. Remember, it's a twofold promise. One, that in you, Abraham, you will become a great nation, even though you have no descendants. You will become a great nation. But also in you, in you, your offspring, 
From your offspring, we will bless all the families of the earth. So there's two promises here, one for a great nation and one for all the nations of the earth. So the promise is for a holy nation and from its offspring to extend to all nations. And again, I don't want us to forget that this nation was a nation that was called out from among the nations. After creation had rebelled against God, what we see in, in Genesis 3, the, the rebellion of individuals in the choice that Adam and Eve made. And then the rebellion of the whole earth in Genesis 6, when God brought the flood, he brought destruction, but salvation was available through water. And then in chapter 11, where the whole earth has now rebelled again, God purposely divided them. Why did God divide the people at Babel? Let's read in, in Genesis 11, 5 through 6, it says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all, and they all, they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. I don't know about you, when you read that, they have one language, they have one will, that sounds like unity, that sounds like a good thing, right? God's opposition was not just the construction project that was at hand, but God in his wisdom purposely divides a nation because the, the, the danger of a unified will of created ones who still listen to the serpent's voice. It was for their protection because it was about their will. It wasn't about the will of God. No, let's make a name for ourselves. And so God purposely divides the nations. He purposely divides the nations. And then he calls Abraham, whose parents and himself served another God. He calls him out to create this new nation. This promise is for you to be a great nation. The holy nation, Israel, wholly separated but through you, a blessing will, through your offspring, a blessing will come to all nations on the earth. So when we get to this statement of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior. He's brought to Israel, the great nation. Of this man's offering, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as promised. In other words, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of a great nation but it's still only acknowledging that one part of the promise to the great nation of Israel but how is this the fulfillment to a great nation well they're gonna answer these questions before his coming this is right after the verse that we just read of this man's offspring God has brought to Israel a Savior Jesus as he promised in verse 24 before his coming John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, no. But behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. And I love how it says, as John was finishing his course, living for a purpose, just like Paul and Barnabas called out by the Holy Spirit, I have a work set apart for you to do. So John the Baptist, as he was finishing his course, the purpose that was given to him by God, he was finishing his course. And when we get to verse 26 through 31, he was trying to give assurance to this great nation that Jesus is the fulfillment of a promise. And so he does that by showing in the Holy Scriptures how by Jesus coming is a fulfillment of what was spoken of him. That his rejection and that even his death was foretold in prophecy. And so he's giving them assurance that this is the fulfillment of the promise. His rejection and his death. There's assurance through prophecy. There's assurance through his resurrection where they're now witnesses of. And then he says in verse 32, and we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. Here's the good news. What was promised to the fathers is now being fulfilled to the children by raising Jesus. The promise fulfilled to a great nation. But how is this fulfillment of that promise? 
How is Jesus, who was crucified, the fulfillment of a great nation? Because remember, they're still under Roman authority. In their minds, if I'm expecting a great nation, I don't expect to be under the rule of, of, of Rome. No, we've got to be a great nation. So when the Messiah comes, when the Christ comes, he will lead us to be that great nation. In their mind, their great nation was this geopolitical power over regions, over, over other nations. But that was not the intention of God's promise. How could this be? So he supplies them with more prophecy to give them more assurance to this great nation. In verses 33 through 35, he quotes from David and David, what he said in Psalm 2, and how the things that what David wrote were not about David, but they in fact were about Jesus. When he calls him, you are my son, I will give you a holy and sure blessings of David. He doesn't give the blessings of David to David. No, from his offspring. That's what that's referring to. You will not let your holy one see corruption. And so these are not about David, but these are revealing that these are spoken of Jesus. So I think at this point, basically, in this word of encouragement to this great nation, he says, to the holy nation, I know you don't understand how Jesus being crucified fulfills this promise of a great nation, but hold on. Let me explain it to you. So, in verse 36, for David, after he had served the purpose of God, in his own generation fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. So number one, notice first David who also uh, served the purpose of God. So just like Paul and Barnabas, called by the Holy Spirit, a work set apart for them. Just like John the Baptist says he had finished his course serving the purpose of God. So David served the purpose of God. And there, he explains this fulfillment to this great nation. The fulfillment of the promise for a great nation is not the geopolitical power that they were expecting in their land, but the, the fulfillment of the promise for the great nation was that through this nation, salvation would come. That through this nation, through the offspring of David, that salvation would come. That it would free us through this man Forgiveness of sins is available and being freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law. Because the law will never bring us freedom because it will only convict us of our sins. We are all flawed. We are all flawed and the law cannot bring us to righteousness for a, before a holy and perfect God. And so this good news to a nation, the fulfillment of a promise, it's a new righteousness. Begin to see as people's minds begin to open to see, is this what is meant by the promise? Is this different than my expectation? Yes, but people begin to see this and they, they are holding on to this. this could, could this possibly be the fulfillment of the promise? New righteousness? New righteousness by faith? This is amazing news for the great nation. A new righteousness by faith, but it also comes with a warning. And the warning is this, beware therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Beware of this, this is the warning. Look you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. The warning is this, becoming scoffers, or mockers of what? A work that you will not believe. Understand the promise to a great nation in a different way. The fulfillment of the promise to a great nation is actually salvation through a new righteousness, not through our law, not through our religion or customs, but it's through faith in Jesus. 
and be careful. Be warned. Don't be scoffers of a work that God's doing. A work that even if you were told, you wouldn't believe it. And at the conclusion of this meaning, it says in verse 42, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. So they heard this news. They heard about this explanation that the promise could be different than what they expected because it's a new righteousness, not a political power. And they begged to hear, what, what exactly are you talking about? This new work, this, this work of God that is unbelievable. They begged that they would come back the next Sabbath. And after meeting of the, the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Fulfillment of the promise to a great nation. It is good news. It was such good news that they begged them to come back. They begged them to come back for the next, uh, the next Sabbath. But will they pay attention to the warning? Will they pay attention to the warning, a work of God that you will not believe? Verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So here we are, the next Sabbath, the whole city has gathered. They want to hear the news. They want to hear what is this exciting work of God. But the Jews began to get jealous when they saw the crowds. And when they started to hear the words that this was not just for them. They began to contradict them. And so what is this unbelievable work of God that this new righteousness is not just for the great nation, the holy nation of Israel, which they were so excited about just one week prior, but this new righteousness is available to all nations. All nations, not through a new religious system that Jesus was bringing, but through faith in him. Fulfilling the promise to a great nation and to all nations. Well, they didn't take this very well. In verse 50, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. So they're not taking this very well. They incite violence. They are connecting with the women of high standing, the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution and they drove them out of their city. What a difference a week can make. From Sabbath to Sabbath, this is the same group. The same group a week prior who loved thinking about the promise to a great nation in new ways. Maybe it's not a political power of a regional power but maybe the fulfillment of the promise to be a great nation is this new righteousness by faith. But to apply that, not just to the holy nation, to all nations, they didn't want to see that. They didn't want to believe that. They could only see half of the promise. Only see half of the promise to the great nation. But what's amazing about what God is doing here is he, he is a repeat of history. God is doing the same thing that he did before. Remember, God purposely divided the nations, and out of those nations, he called out a new one when he called Abraham. And now God is doing the same thing. He's calling out a new nation from all nations, a new righteousness by faith in Jesus. 
So it's so neat to see what God is doing. The two will become one, but they incited, they stirred up, and they drove them out. Verse 51, but they shook off the dust from their feet again, uh, from against them, and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So they shook the dust off. Uh, you know, they, you can't control everyone. They didn't want to accept this message. But they left and they were rejoicing. They were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. And I want to know, why were they filled with joy? Was it because they were rejected? Was it because they faced uh, the certainty of, of persecution? I think they were filled with joy because they were about the purpose of God in their life. They knew what they were doing was the work of God. They had purpose in their life. And so we see them being filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy because they are on the purpose of God. And the purpose of God is sim simply put as this, to fulfill his promise to the holy nation and to all nations by way of this new righteousness apart from religion. Purpose fuels passion. And I want to know today, do you see yourself in the text today? Do you see the purpose of God? that was played out in the lives of Paul and Barnabas? Do you see the purpose of God that still remains today? Do you see the purpose of God that is, that is continuing to be placed on the hearts of his children? That those around us, that, that our neighbors, that our co-workers, that the people that we engage with in our life that would know about this new righteousness that comes from faith in Jesus? Do you see and know and recognize your purpose? This morning, like David, after he had served the purpose of God, we are witnesses of this good news. Let it change us. Like Cricket was saying this morning in communion about the things that hold us back, the way that we can be changed by Jesus, this new righteousness that is available to us, changes our life if we let it. And when we allow that change to be affected in our life, it gives us purpose to bring that change to other people in their lives. This is the purpose of God. It's the purpose of God from all time. To save his people. To save a people that wants to reject him because of the free will that he gives to people. But after rebellion and rebellion and rebellion, God does not give up on us. And the purpose of God was to make a great nation and to bless all nations, and he did that through Jesus. And it wasn't through religion, and it wasn't through gaining righteousness from doing all the, the right do's and none of the wrong don'ts, but it came by faith in Jesus. And we are to be witnesses of Jesus in our life, and to, that should be the purpose behind our life, to share this good news not this good religion, but to share this good news of Jesus, how this changes everything by our faith in him. Will we live out this purpose? God's calling you. God's calling me to live this purpose. Maybe you hear the call like Moses and you say, nope, wrong guy, not me. Not going to do it. Look somewhere else. Or maybe you're like Gideon and you say, you know, I'm the weakest in the least. Maybe you hear that call and you're like Isaiah. Who will go for us? Here I am. Send me. Or maybe you're like Samuel. Speak for your servant is listening. Do you know the purpose? Why you're here? The works that are set out, that are laid out by your creator God before you were born, works for you to walk into. As we live out not our purpose by our will, but as we live out the purpose of God to bring all nations to him through faith in his son. This is our purpose. This can fuel our passion when we live for the purpose of God. So we'll, we'll say this prayer together this morning. Perfect your love in me to love others. 
Raise up your church to proclaim your name. I am prepared to share my hope. Continue your amazing acts as I go and love. Let's pray together. Lord, we just want to ask a special blessing this morning. We are, uh, there are so many things that are just hard to process. We're, we're calling out to you. We've lost control, Lord. We pray for the things that are taking place in other nations, other countries. Lord, we pray for this nation as uh, weather is, is coming, um, landing as we speak. Lord, we pray for your protection. Lord, we, we give you all of those things, all of our fears, all of our concerns. Lord, all of our burdens that we, we continue want to carry around in our life. Lord, we give those to you this morning. Lord, we have everything we need in you. Lord, we lay everything down, all of our cares, all of our burdens, all of our sin. We lay it all down before you, God. And Lord, we're grateful that we can be changed, that we can be a new creation, not because of us and what we do, but because of us giving up everything to you, our will. Lord, help us to live with that purpose, your purpose, Lord, that you would give that purpose in our life to be, be sharers of this good news, to be witnesses of the good news of Jesus in our life to the people around us, Lord. Empower us, equip us. Lord, help us to rejoice and, and be filled with joy in the Holy Spirit when we're rejected even, God. Help us to live your purpose each day that we live on this earth. We pray this all in your son's name this morning. Amen. If you'd like to respond, we'll give you an opportunity now as we stand and as we sing. All at once, oh dear, build my life upon all this world reveres and more.
Y'all aren't smiling when you sing these words. The last song we do, you're going to be. Promise. Please. Now, uh, stay with us. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you for joining us online if you are. <clears throat> I want you to know that we want anybody who wants to come here to be comfortable. We have spread out. We, we ensure your safety. Fair enough, Jimmy. We, we, if you feel comfortable, we'd love to have you. As a, we got a pretty good group here today. Stay, stick around for Sunday school. Uh, today, is that it, Craig? Did I get them all? Good. <clears throat> this is our closing song. This is... Yeah, you got to smile for this one. <clears throat> we have heard the joyful sound of Jesus said. for joining us online. I hope that you were encouraged or challenged or whatever God's intention was for you this morning. But Acts, the beginning, the birth of the church and the Holy Spirit empowering witnesses to share this good news of Jesus. You know, it's exciting for me to think and to ponder how God is going to continue to use his church to spread this message to go in love. Well, Go and Love is not just a sermon series, it's also a campaign. It's a work of us asking God to do a great work through us, to use us to bring others to Him. Loving others by sharing Jesus is a beautiful thing. And if you this morning are saying, that's not me, well, that's actually a good thing because this is a work of God that is made perfect through our imperfections. So thank you again for joining us. If you are local to the Jacksonville area, then we would love to meet you. Uh, come and join us so we can walk in life together. If you're joining us from afar, what a blessing it is to be joined together through Jesus. And I want to invite any of you who are watching today to consider contributing to the ministry here at Argyle. You can give online or you can send in your contributions directly to us. Remember, love people follow Jesus, serve community, and praise God. We'll see you soon.